The Durian Heat, bringing big ideas and critical opinions in Southeast Asia. Good morning, this is Arlene and you're listening to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing today on our Durian Heat. We're going to talk about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. As we all know that the cost and benefit analysis have been released uh, last week and of, we have uh, the main author of uh, the cost and benefit analysis to share with us whether TPPA, is it a boon or a ban? So first of all, I just want to say welcome Firdaus Sulosi, the fellow of International Institute of Strategic and International Studies, or short for ICES Malaysia. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. So, um, tell us more about the overall overview of this uh, cost and benefit analysis that uh, you have done. Well, first of all, the uh, the um, it, it is not entirely a cost and benefit analysis because oh, that no? is being handled by um, another organization altogether, uh, by PwC. But the one that we did. Um, is called the National Interest Analysis. Mm. It is the first time in the history of Malaysia that the government is embarking on um, such um, assessment. Um, in in countries such as the New Zealand, for example, the NIA is being handled by the government um, themselves, and um, they usually um, they usually broadcast the NIA right after a treaty has been concluded or near to be signed. So in the case of Malaysia, we are taking a slightly different approach, whereby our NIA is being um, is being done by an independent assessor, i.e. Um, ICS Malaysia in this uh, in this respect. Um, although it is commissioned by the government, mm. um, there is n- no um, influence whatsoever on on the behalf of the government in the NIA because um, we try our very best to portray whatever that we think will affect um, the national interest as oh. a result of being a participant bat- in TPP. Let me backtrack a bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's the difference between cost and benefit analysis and national interest benef- uh, analysis? Uh, there, there are significant differences between the two. Um, the first of all is that the CBA usually involves some form of uh, ass- um, numerical assessment. They will use um, perhaps... Um, Trade modeling, for example, um, and and uh, to a certain to a um, to a certain aspect, um, how much um, the impact will be as a result of um, signing an agreement, for example, or being involved in a contract or infrastructure pro- uh, project, for example. So such assessment can be a certain um, w- in numericals like, like what I s- mentioned earlier. On the other hand, the national interest analysis is very much a broader view of things because not only we, we look at numbers, but we also look at other factors, that any factors for, for that matter. You that mean social economic factors, social political factors? Um, in our NIA, okay, uh, difference from, it's, it's a slight departure from what um, other countries are doing. Like in the case of Malaysia, because like I said, we've never done this before. So we uh, try to create our own framework as far as the NIA is concerned, Malaysia's NIA is concerned. And we divide it into three three pillars, security, social, and economic. So in terms of social, uh, in, sorry, in, um, let, let me start with um, security. Security are those that involves things like sovereignty, geopolitics, um, public order and stability, health and safety safeguards, um, technological innovation, for example, and and those things affect the security of a nation, Malaysia's mm-hmm. uh, um, uh, um, security matters. Um, on the other hand, we have um, the social pillar, whereby this will impact first and foremost um, the Bumi Putra participation and welfare, and then there will be. This is more about the people. Yeah, more about. Mm-hmm the people in the agreement kind mm-hmm. of uh, kind of thing so um involves things like labor standards good governance cost of living mm. um social welfare and so on and so forth you know um and also the environment as well because mm. you know it's about mm. the people and then uh last but not least we have the third pillar which is the economic pillar where it involves anything that has to do with the future prosperity of the nation Market access, investment, the SMEs, um, innovation, 
um, um, uh, public welfare and 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 um, those things lah. Mm-hmm. So uh, these are really broad categories. I wonder how long it took you to finish all this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It took me. It it took us quite a mm-hmm. while to to understand first of all the framework because you know th- many of these things were not defined mm-hmm. uh, earlier. For example, like Bumi Putra participation and welfare. Um, what constitutes Bumi Putra yeah, participation? Yeah, could it be just quota? Is it like yeah. number of people you've trained? Could be anything, right? Yeah. Uh, because it involves in in every part, every you know, every um, fabric of the society. Mm. So um, w- it took us quite a while to come up with a framework, and then once we have agreed with the framework, then we have to take the agreement, the actual TPP agreement, and then try to dismantle it and internalize many of these areas, you know. Were and there any intervention at all during the process of your research? None. None, <laughs> so none, in, in none at all. In fact, we, um, of course, uh, we had to get involvement of um, of the government, more more importantly, the, the negotiators, because we needed to know, to um, th- we, we needed to ensure that whatever that we understand from the agreement is whatever that the negotiators and the legal um, um, uh, the, the legal aspect of it are, are covered as well. Mm-hmm. So um, we had to involve them in in the discussion, and um, there are, there are many a times where we think that oh this is what we understand from the from reading it, but mm-hmm. um, when we try to um, explain it to them, they say that okay, um, but that is probably half of what. It mm-hmm. is mentioned here, but the other half is this blah 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 blah. So um, the the involvement in this report that we did was very broad because it did not involve just from the government side, civil societies as well, various stakeholders, even politicians. We did involve um, politicians because we needed from to all sides, from both sides. I see. Mm. Because we needed to know what the beef really. Mm-hmm. What the beef really is. What about the civil society? Yeah, we did. Um, we did engage the um, environmental people. We did engage the um, uh, the AS council as well. Mm-hmm. There are quite a number of them. If you look at our bibliography. Mm-hmm. I also want to know about uh, the TPP document because a lot of people uh, ask why only now. Uh, there are a couple of people that I met. They were mm-hmm. like. If you want to do like a national interest analysis or even a cost benefit analysis, why not do it during the process of negotiation or prior to uh, the TPP being released to the public? Uh, well, there there are many ways to look at this. Um, number one is that you can look at um, having some form of analysis, mm-hmm. okay, some of assessment prior to um, engaging in, um, into a negotiation. So you will you will probably expect certain areas that you want to cover in the uh, in in the report and say that okay this is what we want this is what we have to be um, be aware of and so on and so forth mm-hmm. and then there's also another angle that say that maybe we should also have a report during the negotiation mm. because we needed to know how much it will impact pre and post mm-hmm. uh, negotiation and then there's also one um, uh, one angle that we can say that have a report once everything's done because only then we know to a certain to a, to a, to a great extent slash detail what exactly the what exactly the agreement means uh, in the context of Malaysia. Mm-hmm. Maybe we can have all three. Maybe we just have one. Um, mm-hmm. That but is up to interpretation. But it's a bit too late, isn't it? I mean, Malaysia has been in the no- negotiation for quite some years mm-hmm. before this. I mean, the report is not necessarily just for Malaysians, but also for the negotiators. They need to know what's at stake for them. As far as we are concerned, as far as ISIS Malaysia is concerned, mm-hmm. uh, or at least my team is concerned, is that we need to know the final agreement. Mm-hmm. We need to know what the exclusions, what are the exemptions, what are the carve-outs that we will get as a result of um, having a p- uh, being a party to, to this negotiation. We don't want to know what we don't get. Mm-hmm. Okay, Of course, that is important too, but we want to know what we get first before we, we can ascertain um, other, other areas that is important to our report. Mm-hmm. So we need to know everything. Not just the agreement, we need to know the annexes, we need to know the the side letters, we need to know almost everything. Interesting. Mm. Another thing, 
uh, the Malaysian government commissioned you, uh, ISIS Malaysia mm. as well as uh, the PWC mm. to uh, do the study. And of course, the PWC did the study on the cost and benefit analysis. But what's the outcome you know, of both reports? Do they tally or do they actually tell the same thing about the TPPA? Well, um, because these two analyses are supposed to be independent in, in, uh, in the nature. So... Um, I will not be able to comment whether they should tell you or they shouldn't tell you. Mm-hmm. But what uh, what I know for a fact is that we, both of us, have never involved in any part of their assessment as well. So it's been convi- confidential all along. Um, well, of course we we uh, we get along very well because mm-hmm. we understand that you know sometimes we um, we need to know that what we know about a, se- a specific. Provision, for example, mm. is what we both understand. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's it's not as simple as you know you do your thing, I do my thing kind of uh, kind of arrangement. But um, as as far as we are concerned, in in terms of ISIS Malaysia, we have been very uh, very consistent. We know that um, whatever that we write is based on whatever that we know and whatever that we interpret as mm. a result of um, having the agreement. Okay. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll discuss further on the TPP. The Durian Heat. Bringing big ideas and critical opinions in Southeast Asia. Hey, welcome back. This is Arlene and you're with me on the Durian Heat where we discuss issues in Southeast Asia and this time we are going to put a focus on the TPPA whether it's a boon or a ban to Malaysia. Earlier on, we give a brief overview about the TPPA National Interest Analysis which was, which was done by ISIS Malaysia and of course with me is the main author of uh, the research analysis, Firdaus Rosli. So, uh, going back to the TPPA, uh, overall, based on your study, which sector or area would be hit the most in terms of negative uh, um, impact uh, by the TPP? I know it is very broad, mm-hmm. but if you can just highlight a couple of uh, sectors and areas. Um, if you if you read our report, um, we highlight it very uh, uh very openly, mm. um, there there will be adjustments mm. um, uh, as a result of being a party to the TPP, um, and these are first and foremost Bumputra participation, um, because there are, there are many areas there there are uh, uh, well probably the most um, significant areas of all is the government procurement, mm. whereby this this area will probably change the. The status quo of um, women putra participation in in government procurement. Secondly, we talk about the labor chapter mm-hmm. uh, and its impact uh, to Malaysia today. Mm-hmm. And um, we also spoke um, um, at at great length um, on ISDS, the Investor State Dispute Settlement, and the mechanism that is in place um, that is much different from what whatever ISDS that we have um, already um, in, in the country. Much dif- different as in like it's much more uh, high risk for the Malaysian government? I wouldn't call it something that is risky, mm-hmm. um, but I would probably say that f- uh, first and foremost, the the definition of investment in the TPP is much wider than any other trade agreement that we've got um, so far. However, um, as, far as, ISD, uh, as far as the ISDS, ISDS mechanism is concerned, we can choose not to adhere to um, disputes when it comes to public health, public safety, and the environment. Mm. So, even e- that okay. By saying that, that doesn't mean that they cannot s- uh, they cannot bring us to arbitration. They mm-hmm. can, but we can choose not to adhere to this um, based on whatever cover ups that we've got um, under ISDS, and this will not impact us in any way. Because there is already spelled out under Annex 9B, if I'm not mistaken. So it's not really a legal arbitra- arbitration. That means if you can choose not to participate in the well, only uh, in these three areas. Oh. Only, only in the, in the areas that I mentioned. Um, mm-hmm. There are areas which, um, for example, if the gov- if the the contract that was awarded is being um, um, uh, retracted, for example. 
or any policies that will impact um, um, the, the contract that that would also be subjected to those but there, that doesn't mean that there are no mitigating factors whatsoever mm-hmm. to to um, for for both parties, whether Malaysia as a government and investors, and also our investors abroad, you know, versus governments of other member parties, can put in place in order for us to make it a smooth a smoother process than what we already understand. Mm. That's number f- number three. Number four is on IP mm-hmm. intellectual property. We there are there are many ma- you know there are many quarters mentioned about rise of cost of medicine, um, copyright extension, and so on and so forth. So we highlight that very um, in in great detail in our report. Uh, but which is true, right? I mean, it, it will increase uh, prices of medicine. It will strengthen the IP uh, rights in this country. Prices of anything will go up, mm-hmm. not just medicine. Mm-hmm. Data rate will go up. Anything will go up because that that's just <laughs> economics. Mm-hmm. That's just value of anything. Mm-hmm. But what we mention in our report is that access to affordable medicine ca- will not be impacted as much because one, um, the patent protection under under the TPP is similar to that of TRIPS, i.e. same thing as what we have today, 20 years. That's for patent. Secondly, the data exclusivity clause. Okay. Previously, it will only cater for small molecules, but now we have introduced it to cover biologics. Um, they, uh, there were reports to say that by lo- we, um, the government of Malaysia also um, treat biologics today same thing as small molecules. So we do also extend uh, the similar five years um, data exclusivity. But now it is more pronounced because it, is, it will be in the law. But having said that though, despite having patent protection, despite having data exclusivity, there is another thing called a 18 month access window. That's only peculiar, that's only special to Malaysia because we have this in our law today. Ah. And with the TPP, it will not affect any of that. Mm-hmm. So for example, if a pharma company introduces a drug mm-hmm. and it will, uh, it will come to our Malaysian market, and according to the law today, that this drug will have to be, uh, will have to be, uh, or, or rather the pharma company will have to apply for protection. 18 months once they apply for similar protection in a country of origin. Mm. So there is no lapse. You know, if there is any lapse whatsoever, it will only fall in between of that 18 months window mm-hmm. and not anything further. So in our report, we say that it will not impact we are not we, we don't see anything about prices because prices of anything will go up and it's I think it's not really uh, substantive for us to argue based based on that note but access to affordable medicine uh, is is there um, post TPP I see access to affordable oh, uh, and mm-hmm. maybe I should also mention that the the final thing that um, that we also highlight is the SOE commitments the state owned enterprises mm-hmm. or in the Malaysian context GLCs SM- GLCs yeah GLCs Mm. They are they are also excluded from this. Uh, uh, the exclusions are very much different from from others, because in the case of uh, let 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 me just focus on two entities. Okay, one is Petronas. Petronas, as far as upstream is concerned, they are they only open twelve activities, twelve areas for competition. Okay, outside these areas, Petronas can uh, as Petronas have absolute right to do whatever the uh, whatever preferential treatment that they want to accord to based on the percentage. So they still maintain some form of, I would say, national Control. interest um, yeah. or state interest. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, mm. uh, but on the downstream, um, uh, preferential treatment can only be accorded based on 70% for the first five years and then 40% after five years. Mm-hmm. And this percentage anything below this uh, percentage can be accord- accorded to either Bumi Putra, entities of Sabah and Sarawak, or SMEs. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there there are leeways to get uh, uh, for, for Petronas, as well as Kazana, because Kazana, they are not subjected to any part of the of the TPP agreement for two years after entry into force. Mm. But after that, 
you know, they are subjected to the 40% um, uh, preferential treatment. I see. And I want to go back to the topic on patenting because a lot of people are very confused about it. Maybe they ha- don't have enough information about it. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to medicine patents, uh, let's say you have products coming out from, uh, let's say, you, the United States uh, flooding the, uh, the Malaysian market. Mm-hmm. Um uh, would it affect Malaysia in a way that uh, we cannot compete in terms of the prices? Um, in what sense? Uh, in terms of uh, the medical uh, prices uh, and also not just medical, but also like what about in terms of uh, the farming industry, uh, in terms of seeds? Um, farming industry? Yeah. Let's say you have Mozanto coming in. <laughs> Oh, like okay. how do you, uh, like how, would it affect Malaysia's um, you know our agriculture sector or our um, pharmaceutical sector? Uh, okay, let's let's start with um, pharma first. Mm. Um, as far as f- uh, pharmaceutical um, industry is concerned, it will not be much different today than post TPP, because one thing, like I mentioned, uh, the access uh, window. Uh, second thing. Is because of the five-year, five-year um, biologics um, cov- uh, protection um, by data exclusivity. Mm-hmm. Um, that and um, as on the other hand, uh, when it comes to agriculture, you have to be very specific because as far as um, rice is concerned, Bernas has absolute control uh, post TPP when it comes to supply price. And um, um, of of rice in in Malaysia post TPP, so on that side we are okay, because you know there there are good carve-outs for this. But others such as um, when it comes to seeds, mm-hmm. um, we have to um, agree to um, principles and um, under UPOF 91. So this would imp- uh, there was this would include things such as uh, access benefit sharing. So they can, um, foreign corporations can come here and use our biodiversity um, for um, f- uh, f- for the purpose of um, innovation or technology uh, advancement. But it they have to acknowledge where they get uh, the, 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 the 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 sources from. Mm-hmm. But let's say they, I mean, gi- this is a in a dy- dystopia world. If mm-hmm. let's say we would go to that area, mm-hmm. let's say they. Patent a seed that is something that Malaysian would eat regularly in terms of the produce. Would it affect Malaysia? I mean, just want to give, get get a clear picture how much foreign companies have controls over Malaysia's uh, industries. That's a bit okay. First of all, that's a bit strong of a of mm-hmm. a um, of an anticipation uh, mm-hmm. because you know we um, by saying that anyone can come here and then claim that you know this is their technology but that's mm-hmm. it's not as simple as that mm-hmm. um, because under UPOF of course there is there is a there's a there's an avenue for for that to to happen but that doesn't mean that we cannot um, put in place um, mitigating factors as a result of this you know le- let me just stress upon one thing okay whatever obligations under the TPP is whatever obligations that the government um, or rather, the country is going to abide uh, abide to internationally. However, that doesn't mean that we cannot have our own laws, our own um, procedures, our own policy to ensure that there is a transition towards this. Mm-hmm. You know, we often assume that okay, they're going to come here and get whatever they want, and then they're going to dump all all cheap stuff. You know. You know, there won't be any generic medicines. You know, there will be only expensive ones. But that's not entirely true. <laughs> okay, there are mitigating factors, mm-hmm. and the government can still put in place policies that can ensure that there, you know, there is a bridge between what we are, or rather, what what we have now, and whatever international obligations that we are going to undertake in the future. Mm-hmm. So in a way that uh, the government can still make changes in the policy and not yes. let foreign companies take control of yes, how um, our product yep, would as long be sold. As, as long as it doesn't impede or rather go against the the international commitment, mm-hmm. it's fine. Okay. The government can install such mechanism. 
Mm-hmm. And another question, I think this is uh, really important because a lot of people have been raising this uh, as well, is the copyright issue which uh, will be extended from 50 years to 70 years. Um, uh, would this burden Malaysia as we are a net content consumer nation unlike the US who, you know, un- interestingly, or un- uh, they are a net exporter of creative content, would this hamper Malaysia's... Um, uh, advances in terms of assessing creative IT and educational materials? First of all, okay, let's let's look at education first. Um, as far as education is concerned, we don't read um, latest textbooks mm-hmm. um, because um, so, uh, sorry, we only read uh, latest textbooks. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't we don't use textbooks that is you know. Well, um, I think textbook is a bit too old school, but let's say yeah. it's uh, a software, as, as, as you know. Okay, uh, yeah, but edu- as far as education is concerned, well, we don't see that will impact as much mm-hmm. because we only use um, new textbooks, okay, not the old ones. But um, when it comes to other areas such as media content, um, creative content, um, that would probably be somewhere where um, we have to consume because we don't produce many of them today. Mm-hmm. Such as uh, things um, such as entertainment um, area, for example, we, we we're not a big player, just like any other countries. Um, but like I, I want Korea to spe- or the I want to focus States. more on software because the future of the world is an internet future, and and who owns the software would be you know the one making the most bucks, just mm-hmm. like who owns the platform for social media. You see, okay, f- um, we have to also take note that um, although in our report we highlighted a few areas that Malaysia will gain today mm-hmm. okay, as a result of being a party to the TPP we mentioned things like textiles, auto parts palm oil, E&E and so on and so mm-hmm. forth okay? but those are what we have today mm-hmm. those are the numbers that we have today but we don't know okay, or we cannot put to a, cert- uh, to a great extent to what sort of investment that will come into Malaysia f- in the future so if investment in the future will come in form of things that will involve neg- uh, creative content, for example, like film, like songs, um, anything that is has to do with entertainment, for example, that will be at the advantage of Malaysia because as a country, we will be producing those if investment on those uh, is coming to Malaysia. We have really have one in Iskandar region, mm-hmm. okay, Pinewood Studios. So... You know, um, th- we are we are not saying entirely that we will be a content um, user for perpetually because it's, it's, that's not going to be it's not it's not right lah. Okay, but um, we are saying also in the, uh, what what we say in our report is that the government will also have to make um, more room or more space for investments in these areas to come into Malaysia as well. Mm-hmm. Because we cannot continue being a user, That's we true. have to start create that content. Mm-hmm. So it this is also in line with current government um, policies, where we uh, we um, give uh, uh, we reward innovation, we reward creativity, and 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 those. We, but we need more of that in a more tangible sense. I think mm-hmm. so. It's not we we cannot just talk about it just in abstract, you know, because anyone can do that. But we need to ensure that. You know, there is, uh, you know, we give incentives for players outside to come and then set your base so that we can also be a content creator. Interesting. Mm. We'll take another short break. When we return, we'll discuss further on this topic. The Durian Heat, bringing big ideas and critical opinions in Southeast Asia. Hi, this is Arlene. Welcome back. You are with me on our Durian Heat. And together with me is, of course, Ferdaus Rosli, fellow of ISIS Malaysia, uh, sharing on the TPP. Um, So, I know there's so many different areas that you have covered and you have clarified uh, to the Malaysian public. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, um, a lot of the people, especially civil society, they are constantly opposing TPP. I think there's a lot of um, what they uh, uh, you know concern with uh, jive with what uh, the society uh, 
is concerned with, which is they don't know much about it, and a lot of the things are very new. And I think most of all, some of the things are real threats uh, to society's uh, at least current well-being uh, at, uh, for the state of us being a developing country. Um, but based on your point of view, uh, do you think their concern is valid and real that the government should address also? Um, throughout the duration of our study, mm-hmm. we consulted quite a number of, um, quite an extensive mm-hmm. um, range of, um, share, uh, of, of stakeholders, mm-hmm. ranging from the government, um, from civil society, um, and, and so on and so forth, and mm-hmm. even politicians, just like I mentioned earlier. So, um, there, and what we highlighted in the report is that we we take note of um, the the uh, the points raised by by these groups, and we think that they are valid. Mm. Okay, we did not say that you know we did not uh, dismiss any of them. So, you know, in fact, we're saying they are valid, but there are some who are really valid, and we take note. There are some who we think that are a bit over amplified or d- uh, a bit in exaggeration. Um, in 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 that in that Which sense. Which part of it that you re- you think the government should be concerned? Um. Uh, in what sense? Uh, which area of concerns that you think that the government should take note on when it comes to TPP? I, I think um, I think things that uh, things that uh things that concern health mm-hmm. is what probably the government should be really focusing in. Uh, mm-hmm. And and we take note of um, uh, points raised by um, the health um, uh, CSOs, and and we think that so even although some of them make absolute sense, but there are some who I think that are um, a bit not um, like I said you know, over amplified mm. uh, things like cost of medicine for example, mm-hmm. um, because I I I don't think that is an issue, um, but um, in in all in all, in general, um, we we highlight them, you know, um, in in great detail in in all this. Mm-hmm. Do you think? I know this is a bit too much, but I really need to know. Do you think this piece of agreement is a neoliberal <laughs> agreement that would only benefit big businesses? Um, earlier on, you spoke about. Uh, why they are a bit sceptical about the agreement. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't blame them. You know, they have absolute... Um, uh, they, they have the right, and, and they are right in believing so. Mm. Um, I think w- one of it is partly because of the... Uh, because of the fact that the text of the agreement was not released to the public mm-hmm. during the course of the negotiation. And it makes perfectly sense from both sides. Okay whereby the, the NGOs, the CSOs are saying that we need to know the details of the agreement, as in we need to read the text in order for us to you know, internalize and understand them and then to ensure to a great extent that you know, this will not impact whatever that we think. And from the government side, it also makes perfect sense because they say that you know, I cannot reveal the text yet because this involves positions of other countries and then when you start comparing, you know, things will just go haywire. And then this agreement cannot be done mm-hmm. um, within the time frame that we want to get it done. But what they promise and what they have delivered so far is that once the tax is done, they will allow 30 days of, of, um, uh, of a window for them to do a legal scrubbing and to ensure that um, all countries understand the same way from whatever a, a tax that is in front of them. Mm-hmm. And then after that 30 day period, it will release to the public uh, and then the public can scrutinize and see every dots and commas of mm-hmm. the agreement. And and it's it's um, it's all up for debate. You know, you can argue wh- whichever way you can. But there are people who s- still think that this is still not enough because um, we cannot change anything. You know, uh, because uh, say if and the NGO said, oh, we want this to be part of the agreement, or we want that to be part of the agreement. But um, based on what we know and what we understand is that, yes, these, uh, these views are very valid, but also we have to ensure, we have to also look at the overall um, assessment of the agreement, you know, 
we cannot be pushing everything <laughs> under the agreement you know we have to be fair you know we have to you know we th- th- there are some that we can push very hard there are some that we can just say okay uh we can agree on having this uh, um obligation but you know there are others where we can push our our interest forward so um it's it's valid i think from from both sides and and i think that even from the government we, we uh and then when when they say that um you know we we take your 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 point that you want this and that but we are aware of all this anyway i and based on our assessment we believe that the government is aware of a lot of things that uh, the ngos are saying in fact they are more than what uh, some some areas not all some areas we believe that the government know uh, much even in much greater detail than what these the uh, these guys are saying mm-hmm. when it comes to our interests in in the TPP. but it's also because the government do not really do any uh, form of um, public awareness on its position only later on you have you know some uh, public uh, discussion by uh, TP uh, sorry by the meeting minister and all mm-hmm. that but I think uh, when it comes to the grassroots many of them still do not understand why Malaysian government is even embarking on this For, uh, first of all I think the minister, the trade minister, is being, um, is taking this thing on its own, mm-hmm. because as a, as a, um, as a mini mi- miti minister, uh, he is responsible for this trade agreement. Mm-hmm. So he is the only one in um, among all the cabinet members uh, to defend whatever that he plans to do in the TPP. Mm-hmm. Um, he has been going all around town not mm-hmm. just him uh, but his officials too um there have been town hall sessions mm, done okay. by by the minister over the last 2 or 3 years and up to a point where we uh, like myself as a research as a researcher think that the minister is revealing a bit too much yeah uh, uh during the town hall session maybe but that's perfectly okay too because he needs to know what exactly that we need, you know, in in the TPP because this is a crimen. It's not about today. It's not about yesterday. But this is about tomorrow, mm-hmm. you know. And talking about tomorrow, uh, mm-hmm. one of the chapter that I find very fascinating is about the labor law mm-hmm. because uh, a lot of people uh, complain that you know this will strangle or will create more uh, problems with Malaysian workforce. But in fact, it seems like. If Malaysia were to adhere to the TPP, we need to completely change the current situation that we have right now. And uh, in uh, the report, you mentioned clearly that we have a couple of uh, human rights violations when it comes to uh, labor acts, like forced labor, char- incidents of child labor. And of course, we have su- we suppress uh, trade unions. And But how? Ha- but do you see Malaysia government being able to somehow keep up with the TPP if we were to sign it? The labor chapter in the TPP is a discipline chapter mm-hmm. where um, it does not offer any form of transition whatsoever. Mm-hmm. You know, because this is something that we just have to agree uh, adhere adhere to. Okay, mm-hmm. so. Um, under the labor chapter, of course, the obligations are very different from what we have today mm-hmm. in terms of two areas, uh, namely freedom of association, mm-hmm. secondly, the right to right to strike. So under these two um, principles of the, I, uh, the, the ILO Declaration ni- uh, 98, um, it will change very much the, the status quo of labor um, the labor sector in the country. That doesn't mean that the government cannot install mitigating factors, uh, mitigating measures, for uh, for us to 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 uh, adhere to these principles. There there are many of them. In fact, um, one of them that I could think of right now is that um, of course we give freedom of association, but such freedom is not total freedom. Okay, whereby you know we can allow. Pensioners to create their own um, association. Mm-hmm. Uh, own union. In fact, we we have union. We have, we have that already. Um, but we can uh, we can limit their participation in strikes, for example. 
and it's that's possible then that's perfectly fine and it's uh, it's allowed anyway and then when it comes to voting before strike happens of course you know we cannot control um illegal labor strikes okay mm-hmm. because they are illegal and then is punishable anyway mm-hmm. you know but there will be legal strikes le- legal labor strikes uh but uh, why we even uh, have there. illegal labor? Uh, wouldn't it be detrimental? I mean, for the company that actually hire those illegal labors? We did not. Uh, yeah, we mm. we. I think we are very transparent when it comes to. Would they be the, pen- penalized? The hiring and mm-hmm. firing of um mm-hmm. of labor mm-hmm. post TPP. We are we are quite transparent in that. Um, wh- when it comes to um strikes, um not everyone can go on strike mm. legally. Of course, they have to go on the on a ballot and then. Of course, um, that you know anything that is above fifty fifty percent or rather fifty one percent of the ballot, then they have the legal right mm-hmm. to go f- on a strike. Um, and uh, you know, um, see, even even that voting itself, of uh, for that matter, is already a mitigating factor. There there are others that we can also um, install in that. For freedom of association, we can. Um, the government can still have the policy space to block any uh, associate association names that will affect things like race, religion, culture, for example. So um, our the the sensitivities of Malaysia today, we we can have that, um, but um, I think that will probably be you know these things will have to be crystallized. Um, in in the near future mm-hmm. in order for us to move ahead yeah. with the agreement. That's all for our discussion today. Thanks for sharing with us. Uh, thanks for coming to Drenasen Thank Studio. Thank you for inviting